Good afternoon. Awesome. Glad to see you all made it back. I'm going to take a little bit of water here, just a second. I have a one question theology assignment for you. Before you respond, I'm not looking for audible responses, okay? So just between you and the Lord, in the silence of your own heart, just between you and him, a one question theology assignment, and that assignment is this. Describe God using only one word. That's right, only one, only one. Do you find that assignment intimidating? If so, consider yourself normal. Such a majestic entreaty should be at least somewhat disquieting to your conscience. A sense of wonderment and awe is always an appropriate response when contemplating thoughts of God. After all, we're talking about the God who declared to Moses in Exodus 33, 20, quote, that no man can see me and live. The same God who declared to Manoah, the father of Samson in Judges 13, 18, where the angel of the Lord, in response to Manoah's having the temerity to ask the angel what was his name, the angel said, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Now, I don't want to upset or offend anyone here this afternoon, but your name may be cute. Your name may be somewhat original, but your name ain't wonderful. Whatever your name is, it ain't wonderful. Only God's name is wonderful. King David wrote in Psalm 145, three, great is the Lord and highly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. So again, a sense of wonderment and awe is always an appropriate response when contemplating thoughts of God. It is perhaps in light of the weightiness of the glory and eminence of God that the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who lived from 1834 to 1892 said, quote, it is not possible that mortal men should be thoroughly conscious of the divine presence without being filled with awe. Conversely, J.I. Packer, who lived from 1926 to 2020 said, quote, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings and the existence of the great God whom he calls Father, unquote. So to endeavor to describe God in one word, or even several words for that matter, is not to put it simply an elementary proposition, nor should it be. I mean, think about it. How does one describe the indescribable? Consider that question as I quote from the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which declares, quote, the Lord our God is one, the only living and true God. He is self-existent and infinite in being and perfection. His essence cannot be understood by anyone but himself. That statement from the 1689 London Baptist Confession is both well stated and accurate. Nevertheless, one can, cannot have an idea about what God is apart from having some idea 
about who God is. In other words, to attempt to describe God is first to attempt to define God. But who in their right mind would dare to undertake such a humanly impossible task as defining God? I pose that question against the backdrop of these words from the great Dutch Reformed theologian Herman Bavink, who lived from 1854 to 1921, who in volume two of his Reformed dogmatics titled God and Creation said this, quote, the moment we dare to speak about God, the question arises, how can we? We are human and he is the Lord our God. Between him and us, there seems to be no such kinship or communion as would, be, as would enable us to name him truthfully. The distance between God and us is the gulf between the infinite and the finite, between eternity and time, between being and becoming, between the all and the nothing. However little we know of God, even the faintest notion implies that he is a being who is infinitely exalted above every creature." Unquote. Now the assignment I posed to you earlier about describing God in one word may seem nonsensical and perhaps even a bit absurd. But the truth is there are countless professing Christians today who consistently engage in such an exercise by ascribing to God only those attributes of his nature and character, which in their minds make them more relatable to him and likewise him to them. They've forgotten what God said in Psalm 50 verse 21, where God said, you thought I was just like you. The desire to make for ourselves a God with whom we can feel comfortable has been the objective of sinful humanity since Genesis 3, when our first parents, Adam and Eve, used fig leaves in a futile attempt to hide their nudity from the very God who created them in that state of physical nakedness in the first place. The reason you and I want a God with whom we can feel comfortable and at ease is because the sin nature that indwells each of us instinctively causes us to feel uncomfortable with him. Consequently, in an effort to deaden and desensitize our consciences of the spiritual disquietude and uneasiness that plagues us as a result of our sinful condition, we endeavor to create for ourselves a God of our own making. We are no different than the Israelites who at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 32 verse one said to Aaron, come make us a God. That's to me, that's one of the funniest verses in the Bible. Come make us a God. What I'm saying is that though there is a sense in which you and I as believers do want God in our lives, we'd have to admit that there are those occasions when we only want some of God, not all of him. If we were honest, we'd have to admit that. We want some of God, not all of him. The 16th century French reformer, John Calvin, who lived from 1509 to 1564, frames such partitioning of God this way saying, quote, to be sure all whose hearts are far from God's righteousness would be glad if his judgment seat, which they know is set for the punishment of all unrighteousness were overthrown. It is this wish which makes them wage war on God who cannot remain God unless he is also judge but because they know that his power over them is inescapable, for they can neither suppress nor avoid it, they are afraid of it. So in order to not appear utterly contemptuous of his majesty, they observe some form of religion such as it is. Yet all the while they persist in defiling themselves with all kinds of vice and in heaping one sin upon another until they have wholly transgressed 
the Lord's holy law and put his righteousness to flight, unquote. As sinners, it is our nature to shun God because as I've already said, God by nature is holy and you and I by nature are not. First Samuel chapter two, verse two says, there is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you. There are any number of scriptures that attest to the utter uniqueness and distinctiveness of God from us, his creatures, such as first Timothy chapter six, verse 15 through verse 16, where the apostle Paul describes God as the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see. There's also Revelation 15, four, which reads, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name for you alone are holy. Commenting on the otherness of God, Dr. John MacArthur writes this quote, we who believe are being conformed to the image of Christ, but our sanctification is always in process. We're being stripped of our former sinfulness and refined through the work of the Spirit into conformity to God's righteousness. By contrast, God is, will be, and always has been utterly holy and perfect, totally separate from any stain of unrighteousness." Unquote. As innately sinful human beings, our penchant to want to distance ourselves from a holy, righteous, and just God is altogether right and proper when you really think about it. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 59 verse two, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Consider also Luke chapter five, verse eight, where the apostle Peter, recognizing that Jesus was, to say the least, not like him, pleaded with Jesus to go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I've prayed that prayer, I don't know about you. I've prayed that prayer before. The 17th century Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs, who lived from 1599 to 1646, in his book titled The Evil of Evils, said this quote, it is the work of the heart wishing that God was not God. For if he did not hate sin as much as he does, he could not be God at all. Now this is plain, and there is scarcely any one bosom that is not guilty of this, scarcely any of you who may not lay your hand upon your hearts and say, this breast of mine is guilty of this, that when my heart is set upon any evil way, I could wish that God was not so holy as to hate this. I would rather that God should like this. I hear, God's, I hear of God's justice, but does, but does not my heart rise against God's justice? And I could wish that God was not as just as he is." Unquote. So my purpose in citing the aforementioned is to demonstrate that as innately sinful human beings, it is our natural inclination to want to distance ourselves from a righteous and holy God. We do this, as I said earlier, because we are acutely aware that God is holy and we are not. Rightly did the 17th century Puritan Stephen Charnock, who lived from 1628 to 1680, declare, quote, there is an enmity in our nature to the grace of faith in Christ since in a state of nature, men are in constant warfare against God. They have no natural inclination to give credit to any revelation of God. Men do not usually believe their enemies or trust them without a caution. Since we first left God, it is natural to us in all straits to have recourse to sensible objects. And because we once left him, we are loath to return to him because our natural pride refuses to charge ourselves with the folly of our first revolts." Unquote. 
Charnock said that our natural pride refuses to charge ourselves with the folly of our first revolt. And that first revolt occurred in the Garden of Eden. Consequently, each of us in this room today knows that what Charnock said about our natural pride is true. We know that. We are not at all unlike the Puritan John Flavel, who lived from 1627 to 1691, who in his sermon titled The Heavenly Use of Earthly Things, confessed, quote, so long as I have been a hearer, a professor of the gospel, so many years I enjoyed its distinguishing ordinances, but have they not all been dry and empty things to me? Hath not the spirit of formality acted me in them? Have not self ends and worldly respects lain at the bottom of my best duties?" Unquote. So the natural pride of which Stephen Charnock spoke is the result of something else that you and I know to be true. So we know innately that God is holy and we are not. But this natural pride brings us to an awareness of something else that's true. That God being God is totally consistent in his being. And what I mean by that is that we know in our hearts that God does not change. He does not change in any way, shape, or form. Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Now, the reason God does not change is because he cannot change. He cannot change. God is today, God is today who he has been, in all of his nature, character, and attributes from all eternity. As Dr. James Dolezal writes in his book titled, All That Is In God, subtitled Evangelical Theology and the Challenge of Classical Christian Theism, quote, nothing about God's being is derived or caused to be. There is nothing behind him or outside him that could increase alter or augment his infinite fullness of being and felicity. For this reason, he cannot subject himself to changes because every change involves a cause that brings to the subject an actuality of being that the subject lacks. Causes, simply put, make things to be. Therefore, if God is wholly uncaused and self-sufficient in the plentitude of his being, then he cannot be moved to some further actuality. This would suggest some imperfection or absence of being and goodness in him, unquote. Now, what Dr. Dolezal is talking about there is what is referred to in theology as the doctrine of divine immutability. The doctrine of divine immutability, the root word there is immut immutable, something that does not change. The doctrine of divine immut immutability teaches that God does not change. God does not increase or decrease. He does not improve or decline. He is not modified in any way due to some altered circumstances. There are no unforeseen emergencies to the one who is eternally omniscient. His eternal purposes stand forever because he stands forever. He does not react. God only acts. Do you hear that? God doesn't react. He only acts. And he does so however he pleases. But you see, though each of us knows that God's nature is immutable, that is, that his nature does not change, that nevertheless does not stop us from trying to change him. As the late Dr. R.C. Sproul says in his classic book titled The Holiness of God, quote, we tend to have mixed feelings about the holy. There is a sense in which we are at the same time attached to it and repulsed by it. Something draws us toward it, while at the same time we want to run away from it. We can't seem to decide which way we want it. 
Part of us yearns for the holy, while part of us despises it. We can't live with it, and we can't live without it. Unquote. Aussie Sproul is absolutely correct. Sinners do have a problem with the holy. And though God's holy and righteous character is unchanging, we nevertheless have a propensity to treat him as if the opposite were true. The result of that kind of misplaced thinking is that we make God out to be less than who he truly is in the totality of his being. As evangelist and author A.W. Tozer, who lived from 1897 to 1963, rather bluntly observed, quote, this is the day of the common man, and we have not only all become common, but we have dragged God down to our mediocre level, unquote. Among the more common ways that you and I engage in such divine diminution as what A.W. Tozer is speaking is that we tend to view God primarily in terms of those attributes of his nature and character that appear to us to be most endearing and winsome. And invariably, the one attribute of God that we single out most often is his love. I am thoroughly convinced that many evangelicals today who, who profess to love God aren't so much in love with God as they are in love with their own subjective idea of what God's love is. To again quote Dr. R.C. Sproul, the normal problem we face is not that people ignore God's love, rather people separate his love from his other attributes. Our most fundamental inclination as fallen human creatures is to exchange the truth that, God's re that God reveals about himself for a lie. We commit idolatry every time we substitute a lesser concept for his glory, whether that substitution takes the crass form of stone gods or the more sophisticated form of redefining God's character to suit our tastes. A God stripped of justice of holiness, of sovereignty, and the rest is as much an idol as a statue of wood or stone. We must be careful not to substitute for the biblical God, a God who is exhausted in his character by the one attribute of love, especially as popular culture defines it." Unquote. Now, one of the more egregious examples of how popular culture is attempting to redefine God's love, as Dr. Sproul said, can be found in a February 2020 article published by New Yorker magazine titled, Richard Rohr Reorders the Universe. Richard Rohr Reorders the Universe. Now, I'm going to come back to that article in just a second. But in case you're unfamiliar with who Richard Rohr is, Richard Rohr is a Franciscan friar and New Age Universalist who is perhaps most notable for his advocacy of the Enneagram. In fact, one of Rohr's books is titled The Enneagram, A Christian Perspective. That's a contradiction in terms, by the way. But Rohr also authored a book titled The Universal Christ, The Universal Christ, and it is in the aforementioned article, Richard Rohr Reorders the Universe, which is a review of Rohr's book, The Universal Christ, that writer Eliza Griswold says the following, quote, Rohr argues that the spirit of Christ is not the same as the person of Jesus. Christ, essentially, God's love for the world, has existed since the beginning of time, suffuses everything in creation, and has been present in all cultures and civilizations. Jesus is an incarnation of that spirit, and following him is our, quote, best shortcut, unquote, to accessing it. But this spirit can also be found through the practices of other religions, like Buddhist meditation, or through communing with nature. Roar gives this presence a name. For him, 
the quote, cosmic Christ, unquote, is the spirit that is embedded in and makes up everything in the universe. And Jesus is the embodied version of that spirit that we can fall in love with and relate to, unquote. Now, I should go without saying that the Jesus whom Richard Rohr is describing is not the biblical Christ. He is not the omnipotent, sovereign, immutable Christ of the Bible who, of his own divine volition, shed his blood on a cross for the forgiveness of sins, according to Matthew 121. Instead, the Jesus that Richard Rohr is proffering to the world is nothing more than a spiritual boyfriend with whom we can all have a romantic crush on. I've termed that kind of romanticized thinking about God deistic amorism. Deistic amorism. The word deistic, D-E-I-S-T-I-C, taken from the Latin word deus for God. And then the word amorism taken from the Latin word amare, meaning love, deistic Amorism. Deistic amorism speaks to our having a paradigm of God and of his love that is of our own sentimental imagination and conception, as opposed to being rooted in the objective truth of the word of God. Deistic amorism falls short of how God's people are truly to understand God's love for us, and conversely, how we are to love him in return, which is with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love God biblically, and please hear me on this, to love God biblically is to love him for all that he is, not simply for what we might imagine or desire him to be. Amen. As the Puritan theologian Thomas Watson, who lived from 1620 to 1686, says in his classic book, A Body of Divinity, quote, there is in God all that may, be, that may draw forth both wonder and delight. There is a constellation of all beauties. He is prima causa, the primary cause, the original and springhead of being who sheds a glory upon the creature, unquote. Now, speaking of Watson's A Body of Divinity, in the preface of his book, Show Me Your Glory, subtitled Understanding the Majestic Splendor of God, Dr. Stephen Lawson testifies to the spiritual impact of Watson's book on his own life, saying this, quote, the table of contents listed individual chapters on the being and knowledge of God. It followed with chapters on the attributes of God, the eternality, unchangeableness, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, mercy, and truth of God. The book also touched on the unity, trinity, and providence of God. The whole rest of the book flowed out of this profound teaching on God. This was the first time in my life that I had seen a list of the attributes of God. I was immediately captivated by the theocentric emphasis of this book. Impulsively, I bought the book and took it home with me, little realizing the impact it would have on my life. As I read A Body of Divinity, my view of God became bigger and bigger with every page. New categories of thinking about God were being planted in my mind. My heart was being deepened. My theology was being dramatically elevated. My worldview was being expanded. My Christian life was being steered in a radically different direction toward higher ground, unquote. Now, notwithstanding his personal avouchment for what many within reform circles, myself included, regard as Watson's magnum opus, what Dr. Lawson essentially is conveying to us is that there is infinitely more for us to treasure and admire about God than merely a singular characteristic or aspect of his divine nature. That fact is germane to the topic I'm addressing with you today. 
Because in order for us to appreciate the love of God, that love must first be objectively defined. And we must turn to scripture for that definition. It was the Puritan Horatius Bernard who lived from 1808 to 1889 in his book titled God's Way of Holiness, who said this, quote, everything in the Bible is decided. It's statements of fact, it's revelations of truth, it's condemnation of error, it's declarations respecting God and man, respecting our present and our future. It speaks always with authority as expecting to be implicitly credited it reckons on our receiving its teaching, not doubtfully, but with certainty. And it leaves us only the alternative of denying its whole authenticity or of accepting its revelations without a qualification and without subterfuge. To excuse ourselves for doubt and indecision and oscillation of faith is to suggest either that scripture is not infallible or that it is not intelligible, unquote. Now, there's a particular verse of scripture that I wanna focus on with you today, but before I go to that text, I want us to consider these words from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, which I believe provide us with some valuable context for the text that I intend to cite with you in just a moment. Spurgeon said this, quote, all true love goes to purification. All true love goes towards purification. And the true love of God goes that way with an invisible current that can never be turned aside. Oh believer, Spurgeon, please. Oh believer, your God loves you so well that he will not let a darling sin stay in your heart. He loves you so strongly that he will not spare any iniquity in you, unquote. It is in light of those words from Spurgeon that I have this question for you. Was your one word answer to my earlier theology assignment the word love? When I asked you to describe God in one word, was it the word love that came to mind? If so, I have a follow-up question. Is your paradigm of God's love more closely aligned with that of Richard Rohr or with Charles Spurgeon? You see, I ask those questions because the divergent perspectives of God's love that are presented by Rohr and Spurgeon bring us to, to a theological fork in the road one in which you must decide whether you are going to believe what scripture objectively teaches about the love of God or what you subjectively believe about it. Remember the quote I read earlier by Charles Spurgeon who said, God loves you so strongly that he will not spare any iniquity in you. The reason God loves his elect so strongly is because his love by nature is so holy, so pure, so righteous, that it cannot and thus will not tolerate or abide unrepentant sin in our lives. We know this from such texts as Habakkuk chapter one, verse 13, where the prophet Habakkuk says of God that your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look on wickedness with favor. In his book, The Duty of Self-Denial, Thomas Watson said this, quote, we think God cannot favor us unless he has us in his lap. Yet he loves and favors us when he gives us the bitter diet drink of affliction. God's rod and God's love both stand together. Thus the rod comforts. It brings us a token of God's love. It is no love in God to let men go on in sin and never smite. This is not love. Take notice, God spares the rod in anger. Did you hear Watson on that? God spares the rod in anger. 
We've got this conception of God that God breaks out the rod in anger. But Watson is arguing the exact opposite. He said God's spa God spares the rod in anger. God's hand is heaviest, Watson says, when his hand is lightest. God punishes most when he does not punish. But now God smites that he may save his people. And is that not love? And the love of God allays and takes off the smarting power of the rod and gives the soul comfort. Watson says, let me feel God's hand so that I may have God's heart, unquote. So again, dear brothers and sisters, I ask you, does your view of God's love equate with what the Bible says about it? Or is it a love of your own making, of your own defining, of your own imagining, a love of loopholes and asterisks and fine print that allows you to easily make excuses to disobey God under the guise that his love is only forgiving and merciful and is never disciplining or chastening. Ponder that question for a moment in light of these words from 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, John writes, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Now notice in John 5, 3, the definite article, this. The word this denotes that the words preceding it are exclusively and singularly what the love of God is by God's definition. In other words, God fundamentally defines our love for him in terms of our obedience to him. John says, for this is the love of God. That means that everything else that's not this is not the love of God. Notice also in 1 John 5, 3, the preposition of. That little two-letter word carries with it a lot of weight. That preposition of is declaring to us that keeping God's commandment is commandments is God's own divine standard of how our love toward him should be defined and demonstrated. So the fundamental question is this, is keeping God's commandments, which is to say, is obeying God what you think of when you think of your love for God and his love for you? There's a saying in the culture right now today that love is love. No, it's not. No, it's not. You see how open-ended that phrase is? It's, it's, it's stupid, but it's open-ended as well. <laughs> Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan from the 17th century, he lived from 1600 to 1680, said this, Quote, if men be sensible that there is a God and so come to have some respect to him in their actions, yet all those glorious attributes wherein he has represented himself to us as principles of our obedience to him, they believe not in deed and in truth. And this is the ground also of all their wickedness. They believe not really. They believe not really that he is a God, of, um, a God omniscient and sees and regards us in all. Though men profess this, yet when they come to commit secret sins, their hearts think not so. For contrary thoughts are the ground of their ungodliness. What, what Goodwin is saying here is that, yeah, we talk a good talk. On the one hand, we'll say, yeah, God's omniscient. He knows everything. But in, in our sinful condition, when, that, when the sin nature when we yield to that and we sneak off into that closet or we turn the lights off or we send these secret text messages to people we, be, we shouldn't be text messaging. In those moments, Goodwin says, we don't believe what we say we do. Not when it comes to those secret sins. Amen. 
Goodwin's words bring to my mind the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. Where he says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Is that the kind of love you have for God? The kind that says it is permissible for you to honor God with your lips while your heart remains far from him? Is your love for God the kind of love that is superficial, shallow, and trivial? A love that you've so idolized in your own mind and heart as to convince yourself that you can wink at your sin and make excuses for the sins for which Christ died on a bloody cross to deliver you from God's wrath? See, the problem we have, even as believers, is we tend to index the sins we commit. See, that's why we can commit secret sins. Josh Spice was preaching yesterday. He was using the example of how dumb sheep are. It is totally legitimate that Christ refers to us as sheep. Because one of the dumbest things we can believe is that there is such a thing as secret sin. One of the dumbest things that we tell ourselves. There's no such thing as a secret sin. There's no such thing as an unknown sin. Now, there may, there may be sins that I'm not aware of, but there is absolutely no such thing as an unknown sin. Is that the kind of love you have for God? A love of loopholes and fine print and asterisks that allow you to make excuses for your sin. Because your paradigm of God's love is only that God is forgiving and merciful. God's not a God of discipline and chastisement. He's this rainbow flat God that just welcomes everybody, sin and all. Just come on in. So I want to remind you, see, Christ died on the cross. He didn't die running with a rainbow flag in a marathon. Christ was, he was murdered. And you're going to tell yourself that, yeah, I can commit this sin over here. When Christ was nailed to a bloody cross with that same sin, you're over here. Is that how you see, is that the cheapened definition of of God's love that you have? Is your definition of God's love that cheap? The 17th century Puritan William Grinnell, who lived from 1616 to 1679, said, quote, Say not that you have royal blood in your veins and are born of God, except that you can prove your pedigree by daring to be holy. Conversely, the 16th century Bible translator and martyr of the church, William Tyndale, said this, quote, Whosoever hears the word and believes it, the same is thereby righteous and thereby is given him the spirit of God, which leads him unto all that is the will of God and is loosed from the captivity and bondage of the devil. And his heart is free to love God and as a result has lust to do the will of God, unquote. That's the love of God right there. That you have a lust to do his will. See, contrary to what the world will convey to you, God's love is not an open-ended blank check. It's not. The cross ought to prove that to you. So this whole love is love thing, that's a lie. John 3.16 contextualizes the love of God. For God so loved the world that, 
that little four-letter word places boundaries on God's love. God's love is not open-ended. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus poses what, in my personal opinion, is one of the most profound rhetorical questions to be found in the entire Bible. Luke 6, 46, Jesus asks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What's your answer to that question? How would you answer that question? Right now, as you sit there, right now in the sound of my voice, that question is being posed to you. It's being posed to me. God knows your heart. It's a rhetorical question, but at the same time, it's not rhetorical. You can't call him Lord if you're not submitting to his lordship. If you have no intention to obey him, stop calling him Lord. Call him something else. Just be honest with yourself. If the love you have for God, if your definition of love provides loopholes and escape hatches in terms of obeying God, stop calling him Lord and just go ahead and do your own thing. It's bad enough to disobey God and then add your hypocrisy to your disobedience. John Murray, who lived from 1898 to 1975, the 20th century theologian of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania said this, quote, love is the fulfilling of the law but love is not an autonomous, self-instructing, and self-directing principle. Love does not excogitate or invent the norms by which it is regulated. Let me pause in Murray's quote here. <coughs> See, that's what the whole love, love is love movement tries to do. It's trying to invent its own norms. But when you look at the whole love is love movement, what you're seeing is that nothing, nothing is not allowed. Everything is allowed as long as it's called love. Even to the extent of abusing children sexually, bestiality, indoctrinating and transforming your three-year-old child so that they don't accept the imago day in which they were created, Because if you love your three-year-old, you will let that three-year-old be autonomous and choose his or her own gender. That's love. Murray says, love does not invent the norms by which it is regulated. Love fulfills the law, but love itself is not the law. Sin is therefore the violation of the law which love fulfills, Murray says. You abrogate law and we abrogate sin. That's what the, lo the love is love movement does. They eliminate the law so there's no more sin. Everything is love. Everything is allowed under the umbrella of love. Abrogate law and we abrogate sin and we make love and emotion abstracted from all activity and meaning, Murray says. Deistic amorism is idolatry. It's idolatry because it makes a single and often misunderstood and misconstrued attribute of God as opposed to who God is in the totality and immensity of his being, the sole motive and impetus for our worship and adoration of him. The God who of his own volition loved his elect enough to save them both from himself and to himself. <coughs> See, we forget that. If someone were to ask you, if you're a believer sitting here today, 
and part of your conversation with, with them, you would confess to them that you're saved, and they ask you, saved from what? What would you say? What would be your response? How many of you would say, <clears throat> yeah, I'm saved from God? I'm saved from God. That's, that's who you're saved from. Actually, it's both. It's a who and a what. You're saved from God, and the what is that you're saved from his wrath. God saved you from himself. The God who saved you both from himself and to himself will not be reduced. He will not be decreased. He will not be diminished to a singular preferential characteristic of his being that is of your own self-centered and self-contrived imagination. Though we may wish otherwise, God is not like us. There was a song back in the 80s, I forget who sang it, but it was the title, What If God Was One of Us? I remember that video in heavy rotation on MTV, when MTV was still MTV. <clears throat> what if God was one of us, just a stranger on a bus? See, that's what A.W. Tozer was talking about. We've taken God on, off of his throne and reduced him to our mediocre level so that he can be relatable to us and us to him. Now, see, a God who's relatable to you, he's not God. Amen. Call him something else, but don't call him God. John MacArthur says, quote, when we, we worship an unchanging, all-powerful God, it make, if that makes him seem far beyond your ability to comprehend, that is good. If you think of God as someone simple enough for the human mind to understand, your God is not the true God, unquote. See, God is a God of love, yes, but see, the question is, what kind of love? That's the question. God's love is not a blank check. In his book, The Believer's Golden Chain, originally published in 1663, the 17th century English Puritan William Dyer, who lived from 1632 to 1696, who was expelled from his church during what in church history is commonly referred to as the Great Ejection that followed the Act of Uniformity that was enacted by the Church of England in 1662, said this, quote, listen closely to this. William Dyer said, quote, Take heed, friends, that you be not always wooing Christ, yet are never married to him. So this is what Richard Rohr is talking about. Richard Rohr has this romanticized visage of Jesus where you just can keep wooing him. That's the Beth Moore Jesus too, by the way, but that's another meeting. <clears throat> Richard Rohr says, no, this is the Jesus you can be romanticized and just fall in love with. But Dyer says, no, take heed, friends, that you be not always wooing Christ and yet are never married to him. Therefore, never leave till you have put the great question out of question. Look upon Christ first without you and then search for Christ within you. He that will clearly see with the eye of faith must shut the eye of reason. It is the will of God that saints shall rejoice more in what Christ has done for them than in what they have done for Christ, unquote. Is your love for God like that? Well, you look at God and you cherish what he's done for you more than what you've done for him? I mean, come on, we got to admit it. Sometimes we don't want to pat ourselves on the back because we obey God. We want to pop our collar and say, God, look at me. Look at me. That selfie, God. <laughs> Take that heavenly selfie. 
But you see, the God who created us in his image is infinitely and immeasurably more incomprehensible than our finite minds ever could conceive. We've done God such an injustice in the church. Tozer is right. We've taken God off, to, off of his lofty throne and we've totally minimized him. Think about the glory of God as it relates to the Old Testament where Moses, who used to meet face to face with God, and the glory of God was so, see, I can't even find the adjective to describe it. The glory of God was such, made such an impression on Moses that when Moses went back to the people, his face shone so brightly that he had to wear a veil. That's the same God you and I serve today. His glory hasn't changed. Same God who had to put Moses in the cleft of a rock or Moses would have fallen face, face down dead. You worship that same God today. Is that the visage of God that you have for your marriage? In raising your children? In being dutiful? In going to work on time? In giving your employer an honest day's work? Is that the God that you have in mind, that God whose glory is so stupendous, whose name is called wonderful, and how you steward your money? How you prioritize your time? Dr. Richard Muller, professor emeritus of history at Calvin Theological Seminary said, quote, God is at once the supreme object of theology and also the most difficult object to know. Dr. Muller could not be more correct. God indeed is the most difficult object to know. That reality is reflected in Job chapter 26, verses 11 through 14, where Job says of God, the pillars of heaven tremble and are amazed at his rebuke. He quieted the sea with his power, and by his understanding, he shattered Rahab. By his breath, the heavens are cleared. His hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. Behold, these are but the fringes of his ways. And how faint a word we hear of him, but his mighty thunder, who can understand? Indeed, God is the most difficult object to know. That reality should instill within us a level of humility whereby we resist the temptation to invent a God of our own imagination. As Dr. Joel Beakey writes, quote, doing theology is an exercise in coming to know how little we know about God and becoming humbler in the process. The more our increasing theological knowledge is sanctified by the Spirit of God, the more our estimation of our wisdom should decrease. Knowing the smallness of our knowledge should discourage any attempt to impress people with how much we understand." Unquote. It is indeed true that God's people should endeavor to know him. But in doing so, we should endeavor to know God for all that he is in, in accordance with all that he has revealed to us about himself in all of his word. And though on this side of heaven, you and I will never know God in the fullness and totality of his divine essence, deistic amorism depreciates what God does want us to know about him on this side of that reality. You see, the reason God is a God of love is because he is love. Amen. God is love. 
You see, but what you and I must understand is that the love of God takes many forms, not the least of which his sacrificial, is his sacrificial love that nailed his only begotten son to a cross so that an attribute of his character that many deistic amorists rarely, if ever, acknowledge, namely his wrath, could be satiated and appeased. It was the English evangelist and theologian A.W. Pink, who lived from 1886 to 1952, who said this quote, it is sad indeed to find so many professing Christians who appear to regard the wrath of God as something for which they need to make an apology, or who at least wish there were no such thing. While some who would not go so far as to openly admit that they consider it a blemish on the divine character, yet they are far from regarding it with delight. They do not like to think about it, and they rarely hear it mentioned without a secret resentment rising up in their heart against it. Is that you? Is Pink talking to you? As you sit there as a believer, is there a secret resentment of God's wrath in your own heart? Are you, as I quoted from Watson earlier, are you one of those people who really in your heart of hearts, deep down, and you know, you know if this is true of you or not, you really wish that God wasn't as holy as he is. You know God hates your sin, but in your heart you wish he liked it. You wish he would just look over it. The Apostle John writes in 2 John 4, and this, meaning this and only this, is love, that we walk according to God's commandments. This, this and only this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. In other words, John is saying that this and only this is love, that you obey God. Now, if your definition of love is anything outside of that, that's not a biblical definition of love. <clears throat> that's your own definition. So that, my dear friends, is the love of God, that we who claim the name of Christ should walk in obedience to him. In 1 John 2, verses 3 through 5, the apostle John declares, Again, by this, this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. The Greek word for liar is liar. Sometimes we want to get so fancy with our exegesis. <laughs> See, God wrote this. I didn't write this. You've already heard over the past, of today and yesterday, <clears throat> all scriptures, God breathed. The old adage, if the shoe fits, applies here. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. That means you're living a lie. You're literally a walking lie. If you say, if you profess to belong to Christ, you claim the name of Christ, and yet you know that you're living in unrepentant sin, you're a liar. You're a living, breathing lie. And the truth is not in you. But John says, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God, there's that preposition again, of the love of God, the love by which God defines it, has truly been perfected. It is against those words in 1 John chapter 2 that I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to leave you with these penetrating words. At least I found them to be penetrating. These penetrating words from Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said, quote, Perhaps they who love the master best 
are the very people who will be the most likely to have such a high opinion of the love which he deserves that they will often chide themselves that they do not love him at all. When they see how little their love is compared with that perfection of affection which God deserves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us for taking advantage of your love. Help us to love you in truth, in accordance with your word. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.